two of the authors here talking about that today. Firstly, Cal Chase, talk to us about will AI eat the earth? Cal. Artificial intelligence is our most powerful technology. Software that solves problems and converts information to, can you give it the back? Yeah, thank you. Uh, converts data into insight is uh, improving amazingly fast. There's a revolution and the revolution is accelerating. If we get it right, it will improve all our lives immeasurably, make them longer and more healthy. If we don't get it right, it will be a disaster. Um, my chapter for Rohit's book is really a, a, sort of a foretaste of this forthcoming book called Surviving AI, which goes through, among other things, the, the three great challenges that AI, we can see from AI today. The first one is disruption, which is happening already. The second one is the it's what we call the economic singularity, which is the possibility that automation will create widespread technological unemployment. And the third one, which actually occupies probably the bulk of the book, is about humanity's greatest challenge, which is how we deal with super, uh, super, super intelligence. But my focus this afternoon is going to be on the second challenge, which is technological unemployment. I was, at a, uh, I was in Madrid last week at a think tank, participating in a think tank about the subject of technological unemployment. And I was really in interested to hear what my fellow think tankers thought. It was a very impressive bunch of people. Um, senior economists, government advisors, and uh, successful entrepreneurs. And the most interesting part of the session was when we voted on whether people think that technological unemployment is going to be real. Um, there's been quite a few good books written about technological unemployment. Uh, Martin Ford, Federico Pistono, and probably the canonical one by Andrew McAfee, and the unpronounceable Eric Bjorn Yeltsin, I've probably got that wrong, uh, the second machine, machine age. But as far as I know, there isn't an organization dedicated to watching to see whether technological unemployment is happening and thinking about what we can do about it. Which is interesting because there are four organizations thinking about superintelligence, which is clearly a lot further off. In Madrid, uh, we did have a vote about whether we can technological unemployment is going to be real or not. On, in one corner, there were the economists who said, we've seen it all before. Agriculture was mechanized in the 20th century, so it went from 40% of US employment to 2% in the new century. Industry has been automated with uh, 200,000 odd industrial robots being installed each year, and administration has been automated. You have to be knocking on it to remember when middle managers all had their own secretaries. And there's probably nobody working today who remembers when financial institutions employed battalions of human computers. Uh, um, the economist said, this has all happened before, the economic singularity, technological unemployment, it's all hype, it's all hot air, uh, it's seen all before, nothing to see, move along. In the other corner, there were academics, uh, technologists, and a few writers like me, saying, no, actually, it is different this time. Computers are increasingly doing what we all do, and they're doing it better, and they're doing it more cheaply. Think about transportation. There are, um, there are about six, there are about three and a half million truck drivers in the US, and there's about six and a half, so about uh, 650,000 bus drivers and 280,000 taxi drivers. Now, self-driving vehicles are not perfect yet. Uh, they can't cope with heavy, heavy rain and snow. They struggle a bit with potholes and they're not very good at discriminating between a pedestrian and a policeman telling them to stop. Those hurdles are being overcome, and they will be overcome. Now, if a truck, uh, if, if the cost of a truck operating in a truck is 50% accounted for by the driver, the time is going to come when the truck owner says, sorry Fred, I can't afford to employ you anymore. So that's four and a half million people who will be out of a job. Professional jobs are online as well. AI systems like Watson aren't going to stop at decision support. When the day comes when everybody has to admit that Watson does a better job of diagnosing uh, and recommending than human doctors, lawyers, and engineers, then Watson will become a decision-making system. If computers are going to 
to steal all our jobs, can we all find new ones? Well, it's unlikely. Our grandparents wouldn't have understood what we mean by email marketers and by user experience designers. But actually, in 2014, 90% of the jobs that Americans did were jobs which existed 100 years ago. So we were arguing an economic singularity is coming, and we have to we have to prepare for it. If we're lucky and wise, then we'll create an economy of radical abundance and we'll have uh, universal basic income, and everybody around the world will live the life of a middle-aged, uh, middle-aged, middle-class American. <laughs> If we're unlucky or unwise, we'll have riots, we'll have economic collapse, and we'll have David's politics 0.0 with uh, a surveillance economy and a repressive regime where a tiny number of people own all the AI and they suppress the rest of us. Now, interestingly, that vote in Madrid, um, my side lost. By a small majority, the group decided technological employment, unemployment is not real, it's not coming. And who knows, they might be right. It's notoriously hard, perhaps impossible, to predict the future. But interestingly, the future always looks obvious in hindsight. My favorite example of that is the smartphone. I'm pretty sure that 30 or 40 years ago, nobody predicted that we would all have clever pieces of AI um, in our pockets in the form of telephones. But that is what's happened. And in hindsight, it not only seems natural, but it's also really logical. We are intensely social animals. It's because we have language and we can communicate that we can organize and send out instructions and support, <coughs> create economic surplus. And it's because of that, that uh, the future of this planet and every species on it depends entirely on us. So I wonder what the equivalent of the smartphone is for technological unemployment. And I think we need to be watching out for it. I think we need some organizations which watch out for it. So who knows? Perhaps in the next few years, futurology is going to become a mission-critical profession. Fascinating enough, we were with uh, IBM Watson yesterday talking to a group of corporate lawyers. And IBM have removed the term artificial intelligence from anything to do with Watson. They're so worried about it being perceived as this job remover. And they're now calling it augmented intelligence, which is probably not the same initials, but a different explanation. Okay, we're now going to hand over to Martin Didov, uh, who wrote possibly one of the most technical chapters in the book, which is actually very readable, though on uh, artificial neural networks and machine learning. Martin, over to you, Martin. Um, actually, originally the chapter was going to be on, um, I was also present on connecting brains, but uh, Andrew was doing that instead, which uh, was part of that chapter. Um, so I instead of talking about, well, it, it's a uh, chapter, the chapter was called Briefest Introduction to Deep Learning and Artificial Neural Networks. Classic industry yeah. developments and hopes. Um, yeah. So hopefully it's not too technical. Um, it's kind of what I'll throw at you, uh, briefly. So first of all, for, for those of you who don't know, machine learning is basically about throwing data and automatically getting something useful out of that data. Um, categorization, predictions, all sorts of stuff. One of the most uh, famous ways of doing this is with artificial neural networks. Uh, they're very flexible, they're very powerful. You can train them in different ways, supervise and supervise reinforcement learning. Um, they can either be pure feed-forward or feedback. Right? Uh, feed-forward just means that you have um, your inputs and they get processed sequentially by uh, nonlinear processing nodes or neurons, uh, and you get your useful output. <coughs> feedback means that you have connections that go backwards or that go laterally within the same layer. Um, and feedback networks are super cool. You can do really great things with them. Actually, uh, you can show that recurrent networks uh, can can actually implement a universal Turing machine. So anything computable can compute it. Uh, but many useful things can be done by feedforward networks, which are much simpler. Uh, so a lot of the things you hear about um, in on the news about machine learning or, or deep learning or whatever is usually about feedforward networks or feedback in part, but not uh, feedback. Um, so to 
make them do something useful, you have to get, you have to train them basically. You have to adjust the connections between them, and that's that's basically the line design. And uh, those are usually represented by real numbers, so you can you can take a big matrix of real numbers uh, between each of these nodes or neural pairs, and you can uh, adjust them and train them, and then you get the network to do something useful. Okay, let's see. Well, basically, you just add many layers and you make it deep. But what, 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 is it, what does this mean, though? Well, it, it means you can do a lot more things with it. It does a lot more things automatically. And one of the things is that you need a lot more data then uh, to train the network uh, because you have many more parameters. But one of the cool things about deep uh, learning, deep networks, is that they can discover patterns by themselves, essentially. Um, in, in the past, with uh, shallow neural networks, you have to uh, do a lot of uh, feature engineering, as it's called. In other words, you have to take your data and transform it in some funny ways for your particular case. You don't really have to do this with deep networks. Here's an image I stole from NVIDIA. Basically, uh, the way it works is, uh, as some of you might know, is you throw a lot of uh, uh, some type of data, let's say a lot of faces at it. And the first layer start picking out um, the first layer start picking out uh, low level features like lines uh, slanted in different directions and, and colors. And then as you move towards the output, you start getting higher level of abstraction of the features. So you can pick out mounts and noses and stuff. And then later on at the outputs you can pick out um, specific faces, so you might have a Sarah output or a Martin output or a David output or something. And so when you show the network an image of David Wood or Martin Dino in different orientations, they can say, ah, this is Martin, that's David. Um, um, so neural networks have been used uh, in fraud detection. Banks use it, so if you make a strange purchase uh, online and your bank calls you, your card is blocked, very often, but not always, yeah, that's a neural network doing stuff. Uh, you can use it, this is something I'm quite interested in, I've been getting more and more interested in recently, is um, financial markets and uh, prediction of financial markets and so on. So you can actually use it for, uh, obviously for time series prediction, but you can do cooler things. So once you start making deeper networks, you can start getting insights, essentially, at uh, different levels of abstraction, and in the different layers. So this might be used, I mean, it's quite used, it hasn't really been used that much yet, but you can start, you can imagine um, that simpler uh, economic data or financial data might be fed into the network and you get predictions about macroeconomic uh, outcomes. Quite fascinating. Uh, this is a little graph from my OPG research. Uh, the blue is real brain data, the red is a prediction from a neural net from a deep multilayer perceptron. It's a feed forward network. And it, it's never seen the blue data before, but it predicts it pretty damn well. Uh, it's quite a useful thing. Uh, recently, Watson, I mean, everyone knows about Watson here probably, but recently Watson, um, the IBM acquired uh, Alchemy API, which are a deep learning uh, startup. They're going to be integrating that into Watson properly, which is quite nice, uh, because it, it, it hadn't quite used deep learning, uh, per se, until now. Obviously, robots. Um, one of the cool things about deep learning is, uh, like I said, uh, you can recognize faces and people at different orientations, that kind of thing. That's probably going to be done ever, more and more with deep learning because it works really well. And basically, as long as you throw it enough data, it can do very cool things. So they are very powerful, but they're not the best approach for every type of problem. The human brain is pretty complex. Uh, it, it's um, what I'm studying, my PhD is in uh, the computational neuroscience stuff. Um, if you want to build an AI that's as complex or, or, or better than the human brain, or you want to study the human brain and understand it, you're not just going to do deep learning. Uh, you're going to use statistical methods, graphical models, like Bayesian networks, all sorts of stuff that you may have heard about. But the point is this. The point is what we really need, uh, and, and I hope you guys get into it and are excited to work on this. As, uh, as, uh, what we really need is we need meta methods that know when to use any given method in any given situation. So some methods are good for uh, categorization, some are good for four, time series forecasting, some are good for other things. But the idea is when do you use the right method? And that's, that's, the, that's really the hardest part about AI actually. It's, um, it's easy to find a method that works in one situation. It's hard to generalize. So building an AGI is actually a really difficult problem. Okay, what 
about business. But there is uh, tons of data, and big data is thrown around a lot, but it's a real thing. There is a lot of data, and it's publicly available. And that's the business opportunity, actually, for anyone here. Uh, the methods are, in principle, well understood. There is lots and lots of data, so if you wanted to, you could go and do some deep learning stuff, and you could start a business uh, to do recommendation systems of some kind, um, you know, like Netflix or Amazon or whatever. You can, you can do this today on your laptop if you knew how to. And while it may seem somewhat magical, that's all right, because there are incantations that can help you. EO is magic, so I urge you to learn <coughs> incantations. <laughs> So we've now got uh, about 10 minutes for questions with Callum and uh, Martin. So will they come to the front? Oh, so, yeah. Uh, um, ethics, compassion, set of things that we call humanity, are these meta-methods or do they go deeper than that? So they're they're meta-methods, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. In what, in what sense? So, so, so I'm very fascinated because I think that's where the frontier of, of the whole uh, in principle, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is certain set of approaches and methods apply to some situations <coughs> and logically they may apply to others, but there are there are considerations that we you know, choose through training, psychology, society, our values, our sets of values that um, make those approaches perhaps um, unsuitable or wrong, plainly plain wrong, using our, 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 our set of values. So would you argue that, that these are basically as simple as uh, programming the meta-methods and, and, and the ability to select the right approaches, or, or is there something, something more to this than that? Because that's the first law of robotics, isn't it? You can program that, but, but you know. I, I don't think e ethics, in, ethics in AI is usually mean, used to mean. Oh, how how so people are back in the <laughs> um, e Ethics in AI is usually used to mean how do you avoid creating a, actually using AGI, a super intelligence, which will harm us. It's a big, hairy problem. Uh, nobody has the answer yet, obviously. There's two ways you can do it. You can either control, uh, you can control it, contain it, constrain it, or you can affect its motivation sets. Really, really hard problems, and they're not any, anywhere near starting. People are just starting to work. Uh, but what's really good is that since Boston's book, Nick okay, Boston's book, Super Intelligence, came out a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, uh, a lot of people are thinking about this now. There's four organizations dedicated to this, and pretty much all the leading AI researchers, at least in private, acknowledge that it's a problem. We have to do with it. Um, so it's, it's definitely work in progress. And you, you will not expect a solution in the next five years, not the next decade. It's a huge problem. There's a question over here. Um, probably for, for both of you. And do you think that inequality is going to be exacerbated with the high investment on algorithm? Um, I could mention maybe David Hart and Winston Capital, since the financial sector is buying more and more intelligence, they end up uh, holding more richness and more investment, and that will exponentially grow, and they will end up holding the majority of intelligence and the money. Do you think that's going to create a more meaningful world? I, I, I don't really think so. I mean, uh, there, there, like I said, there is an opportunity that, where everyone can get involved with this. It's, you know, all the data is available, the methods are available, so it's not like it, this is restricted to some group of people, right? I mean, you can go and do this and do these, a lot of the things that they're doing, these very innovative you know, AI things. I take it slightly different view. You should listen to him more than me because he knows what he's talking about. Um, he's a bit involved in the business. <coughs> Uh, it does seem to me that if you're Google or, or, or Facebook, you have these massive great data sets and huge installations of servers, you've got a, a big, big advantage. Uh, and you know, one of the things we know about the digital economy is that there's a network effect and the advantage accrues to the first successful leader. But actually, I think, I think that's a transition issue, and I think we, we are going to get to a point where we're going to have to introduce a different sort of economy. 
um, we are going to find that a, at least a large minority, if not a majority of people, will not be able to work uh, through no fault of the rest. I'm going to have to institute something like UBI. Uh, and you know, as David said in his, his presentation, that can go, or it can go badly, you can get politics to the point of zero point zero. But I think in the, in the short term, we will have huge advantage accruing to the people who are better, better at AI. Every industry now is, is going to be the same industry plus AI. And if you're better than anybody else at AI, you're going to do all of it. Question over here. Um, for Cal, um, what signs do you look for and when might you expect them to appear to evaluate if your theory around automated unemployment is coming true or false? It will be as simple as looking at the unemployment rate. Yeah, good question. Um, how, how, can we, how can we tell it's coming? It's, it's really hard. That's why I think we need quite a few smart people work on it. There's people who say that the jobless-ish recovery in the States now is due to you know, this automation. My, my suspicion is it's not, but I can't prove that to you. Um, but I think in, say, 10 years' time, when, say, for instance, uh, self-driving vehicles are really pretty good, and people say, actually, trucks barreling up down on the M25 really don't need a human driver in them anymore, um, and those drivers can't find jobs, I think it will become apparent. Um, but I think we need a smart set of economists and futurologists watching out for it and working out what their options are. In the book by Mark Ford, the Carl mentioned Rice and Robot, she looks at five different uh, hypotheses explaining the, the recent change in economic and productivity statistics in the US and elsewhere, including globalization, including the loss of power of the unions, including technological unemployment, and another couple of things that I can't remember. So I think that's a good starting point. It's probably the best analysis I've seen. And there's a conclusion that is still a little bit unclear, but uh, let's uh, figure out which data we should collect. Now, I've been asked to draw to a halt now because we're going to have more soon. What we're going to do, in a moment, we're going to take a, a comfort break. We don't, don't think it's right to hold you here all the way to five o'clock. So you're going to have a chance to stretch your legs if you want to grab a very quick coffee. Then we're going to come back. We're going to have two more sessions as we just had with two speakers each. And then at the end, we'll have about 20, 25 minutes in which we'll have a longer discussion in which we'll be able to address the points that haven't really been adequately covered. So let's give a round of applause to Carl and Mark.